Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a public interest group that um, specializes in um, exposing the public to new ideas and um, in, a, in a format that's fairly traditional. We have, actually have people present, they speak about the things that they're interested in, and members get to question them. And again, our meet, we meet at um, 11.45 to around 1 o'clock, and our program usually begins at noon. And we're actively looking for new members and um, other folks in the community who want to be involved. Um, today we have um, Washington County Emergency Management Representative, who's going to be introduced by Ann Madden. And we're, but I, first I'd like to indicate we're going to be doing a little something different next week. We're doing an interchange with the Twalton Chamber of Commerce, and their incoming president, Grant Yoakum, is going to be here to introduce Mayor Lou Ogden, who's the mayor of Twalton. We hope to do a few more of these interlocks in, um, in the future. We have um, a guest, um, Mr. Doty, here, and um, we spoke to him about perhaps some joint presentation with, with his group. And uh, as you know, his group has been um, cooperating with Beaver and putting flags on this. And um, Mark Vody is the post commander of the American Legion. So, again, our program today is Rich City Management. And our former president, Ann Madden, our information coordinator and head of our secretariat, is going to introduce this gentleman. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I am so happy to be here today to introduce our speaker, Scott Porter, because I've worked with Scott over the years and I have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, Scott's originally from the Bay Area, then he was in the Coast Guard for 24 years, and eight of those 24 years were spent in Oregon. So when he retired, he had the sense to retire here. And all his family has followed and stayed, and he's got children and grandchildren from Sandy to Milwaukee to Clackamas. But anyway, it's great. So when he began his retirement career, which you know, was about as busy as the Coast Guard career, he spent one year with Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue as in charge of their emergency management. But the county took a look and saw what, and liked what they saw. So they hired him, and he not only was in charge of the county's emergency management, I mean our county government, but now he's the director of consolidated emergency management for all the agencies that you can shake a stick at here in Washington County. You know, we're famous for partnership, but what he's famous for is for helping people get along. And um, I was a PIO, a public information officer, under him for many, many simulated emergencies. Thank the Lord, not yet for that humongous earthquake, but when it comes, you're going to be thanking your lucky stars that Scott Porter is in charge of emergency management in Washington County. So, Scott, you're on. All right, thank you very much, Ann, and uh, thank you, John, Eric, for inviting me today. I'm going to do my best to uh, talk to you about emergency management, what emergency management is, why we do it, how we do it in Washington County, uh, and then uh, you're going to be one of the first groups to hear about some pretty significant changes that are about to occur in how we deliver emergency management services in the county. And to give you a little history that will kind of explain how what we're about to do is significant change from, from where we've been. Um, as Ann said, my background uh, you know, is in the Coast Guard. I spent 24 years as an officer in the Coast Guard. I, did a lot of work in search and rescue, oil spill response, spent about a month, couple of months working on the oil, the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, had a lot of other experiences, particularly maritime law enforcement with fisheries, law enforcement and drug addiction. Personally was involved in a couple of large uh, marijuana busts as part of, part of that work. Um, had a really great experience in the Coast Guard. And quite honestly, I didn't know it at the time, but it was about as good a training and background as you can get to step into the emergency management business. Uh, because my experience in the Coast Guard gave me a lot of experience across broad, broad spectrum of discipline work from law enforcement to fire suppression to oil spill response, chemical spill response, and a lot of other things that all of the disciplines that are engaged in emergency management get involved in. So that was a really good training for me, and I was very fortunate when I uh, left the Coast Guard to get hired by 12 Valley Fire and Rescue to be their first full-time emergency manager. And that was back in 1995. A year later, I was appointed to the director position of what an organization I'll describe to you here in a minute. It's called the Office of Consolidated Emergency Management. It's a partnership. Uh, anyway, I became the director of that group and also served as the county's emergency manager in that, in that capacity until we made some 
changes later on. Again, I'll give you a little bit more history there. I do want to start talking about emergency management and ask you, a lot of participation here, what the heck do you think emergency management is? A lot of people have different thoughts. What, what is emergency management? I know there's a few of you here in the room that really know what it is, but it gets confused with a whole lot of other things. So, any thoughts? Preparing to respond to an emergency. Preparing for response to emergencies. That's a really good uh, short statement about, about what it is. We get confused with emergency medical services, EMS, which is pre-hospital treatment, ambulance service. We get confused with that a lot. Sometimes we get confused with emergency communications and the 911 folks. Uh, but emergency management is largely about preparing for emergencies, preparing for disasters. Do you think we're at the local level, anything like FEMA? No. Yes and no, and, and that's a good answer as well. What, what's the no part, do you think? Why are we not like FEMA at the local level? No money. Okay, that's that's a really big, really big difference. I mean, when when FEMA comes, they come with a whole bunch of money. Typically, if they come, they're coming with money. They're coming with access to a lot of different programs that are managed by different federal agencies that can provide assistance to local governments. They can help reimburse our extraordinary costs for an emergency. They can help citizens, help businesses, low interest loans, grants. Uh, and, they, and they bring a you know, federal highway, they bring federal ag, they bring small business administration, they bring a whole suite of federal agencies that can help provide assistance. They also bring the strength of the federal government and all the other resources that can help us respond. So at the local level, we don't have that kind of money. We're, we don't bring money to help ourselves and we don't bring money to help the citizens. We bring people, we bring resources, we bring volunteers, we bring whatever we can bring at the local level, but we don't have a big checkbook. So our business is about preparing for major emergencies and disasters. We don't do the planning that the day-to-day day -day emergency response. Who does that? You know, the public safety agencies, fire, law, public works, public health, health care, you know, all, all of those individual disciplines do the day-to-day -day planning but it falls to the emergency managers to do the higher level planning for when things go beyond what you're used to on a day-to-day -day basis, when your resources are constrained, when you can't find assistance from, from your partners or from the others uh, from your own agencies. So let's talk about emergency management in Washington County. Now let's talk about it first at the state level. Um, why, why do we do emergency management? Because we need to. I mean, that's a fundamental response. We have threat. We have uh, hazards that threaten us, and we need to be prepared to respond to those. But there is a law in the state of Oregon that requires every county in the state to have an emergency management program. Oregon Revised Statutes 4, Chapter 401 says all counties must have an emergency management program. It says cities may have a program, but it does not require the cities to have a program. If a city elects to have a program, then it has the same requirements as a state-level program. There is a state emergency management office. It's currently a division or department within the Oregon Military Department. For years, it was part of state police. They moved it over into the military department in 2007, I think it was. And that is very similar to a lot of other states. Uh, Washington, uh, Idaho, their emergency management divisions are within the military department. So anyway, counties have to have a program, cities, cities may. And when, uh, when you have a program, there are just a few things that the state law requires the county to have. One is a plan. Uh, you must have an emergency operations plan that defines how you will respond uh, to major emergencies and disasters. Uh, another is a facility um, that you will operate from when you uh, activate your plan and, and start coordinating your response and supporting the local governments in your response. So we typically call that facility an emergency operations center. There are other names depending on what agency it is or department that, that operates that facility, but traditionally you hear it called an emergency operations center, EOC. So beyond a plan and a facility, it also the law also requires us to adopt and 
an emergency management system, an incident command system that we will use to structure how we respond and how we organize in the field and how we organize in our emergency centers. And we in the county have, have adopted the incident command system, ICS. Uh, we adopted that many years ago as our standard management system. It became a national requirement in 2004 in the wake of 9-11. Uh, uh, there became uh, a new system called the National, National Incident Management System, which incorporated the incident command system into it, and that became a kind of national standard for everybody to use uh, for managing emergencies, both in the field and in their emergency centers. So beyond, uh, beyond the state requirements, there, are, um, there aren't very many other things that we're required to do. If you have a county where there are both city and county emergency management programs, then those jurisdictions are required to coordinate with each other, to jointly coordinate their programs, to jointly decide policy and strategy about how their programs will operate, who's responsible for what in terms of doing the planning that goes on in that, in that county. There are other requirements that come along the way that are not tied to law. Uh, there's a policy in the state of Oregon uh, that goes back to the law a little bit. The law says the county must have a program. So one of the roles the counties have to play by state policy is that when we get into an emergency, the county is the focal point for coordinating with the state and communicating with the state, making resource requests of the state. So if we have a large-scale emergency in the county and multiple, in, multiple jurisdictions activate their emergency centers, the county will activate, and the role of the, one role of the county is to coordinate with all of those other local governments to support them uh, and to them to be the uh, interface with the state. If Beaverton, if Hillsborough, if Tiger, needs resources and the county doesn't have the resources to support them, then the county is the entity that makes the request of the state. And it would be the county that would also ask for help from FEMA if that became necessary. We also have grant requirements. Uh, many of the jurisdictions in the state also receive grants, federal grants. There are two particular types of grants that impact our program. One is called the Emergency Management Performance Grant. It's FEMA grant dollars uh, that come every year and have been for years. The county uh, gets money from the Emergency Management Performance Grant program. So does the city of Beaverton. Both the jurisdictions have been receiving money for years. Uh, and with that money comes requirements. So some of those requirements tie back to what the state requirements are. Have a plan, have a facility, maintain your facility, test your facility, exercise your facility, exercise your people, train your staff. Uh, a lot of it goes back to some basic things, but in addition to that, grant requirements would require us to have a natural hazard mitigation plan. They require us to do continuity of government planning, con continuity of operations planning. You might hear that term, COOP, continuity of operations. So there are other things that come with the grants. Another a big grant that's been in place since 2003 are the Homeland Security grants. Um, lots of dollars have come across the country uh, from the Homeland Security Grant Program. There's also money from the, the health, uh, from the CDC and from the Department of Health and Human Services that have really funded emergency preparedness planning for the health departments across the country. So there, with those grant dollars are lots of requirements. And quite honestly, the money's going down and the requirements are going up. Uh, there's a lot of auditing going on of all of that money and there's uh, a lot more, a lot more audit uh, findings and a lot more requirements that are getting tied to that money as the money diminishes. Two big grants here in our county that have affected our county from the Homeland Security side are the Urban Area Security Initiative, the UASI grant, UASI. Uh, that grant, uh, which is used by five counties here in the Portland metro area, has, has brought over $60 million dollars uh, since 2003. Uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, so we've been responsible across the five county area, which includes Clark, Columbia, Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas. We've been responsible for managing all of that money uh, and putting it to the best use possible to better our preparedness for all hazards, but also and specifically to prepare ourselves for the terrorism threat. 
So lots of requirements tied to grants. And in many cases, they go beyond uh, the requirements of the state law in terms of what we need to be doing in our planning. So let me talk about how we deliver emergency management services in Washington County, because we've got a pretty unique animal here, organizationally, that's uh, been around since 1995. Um, Pre-1995, it was a pretty, pretty traditional organization. The county had a program that was organized in the sheriff's office. There were three employees, three full-time employees. They worked in the basement of the jail. It was, in my opinion, uh, in the bomb shelter and acted a lot like they were still in the bomb shelter. It was not a very progressive program at the time. Uh, I would describe it as more of a paper tiger than a real operational organization. Um, and part of that is lack of oversight, lack of accountability, out of sight, out of mind, doing what the law required, doing what grants required. Um, and I, I think it gets influenced by the fact that we have been blessed here in Washington County by not having very many emergencies, kind of real large-scale emergencies. So that tends to put planning into the background. Uh, I've seen, I saw that in the Coast Guard too. The longer you went without an incident, the longer, the more planning got cut, the more training got cut. And I, so I think the program w was a victim in part of itself in the fact that we didn't have a lot of emergencies. No one was paying attention. Um, and then in, in 1994, in the early part of 95, um, a few of the local governments got kind of concerned about the condition of the county's program. But I mentioned to you before that the county's required to serve as a focal point for coordination during the response. So the county really has a, a significant responsibility not only to be planning for itself as a government, but to be ready to support any local government or all local governments during the, during the event. And some of those local governments at the time did not feel that the county was prepared to do that. And that led to the development of an intergovernmental agreement in 1995 to form what, what is called the Office of Consolidated Emergency Management. So in 1995, the county, the city of Beaverton, the city of Hillsboro, and the Walton Valley Fire and Rescue signed that uh, intergovernmental agreement. And it really changed the face of how we do emergency management work in Washington County. That's, that's the year that I started working, was when that organization was created. So what, what was unique about, about it? The first, first thing was that all of the partners agreed to have at least one full-time emergency manager. Up to that point, only the county had full-time staff dedicated to doing planning. TFR had a half-time person, Beaverton had a half-time person. Everybody else was collateral duty, you know. They were, they were the public works director and did emergency management stuff. They were the fire chief and did emergency management stuff. Uh, so in 95 with the IGA, those partners all agreed to have full-time staff. Another significant thing that happened then was an agreement to consolidate all of those employees in a single place. Um, so in late 95, all of, the, all of those emergency managers were moved uh, and put together in 12 Valley Fire and Rescue's then headquarters in Aloha. So Beaverton staff, Tiger, excuse me, not Tiger, Beaverton, Hillsboro, TVFR, and county staff all came together uh, and worked together from TVFR's facility in Aloha. Another uh, agreement that was made was to hire a director for that organization. And in, the, in that beginning, the county agreed to fund that position entirely. However, the director was a TVFR employee. So uh, the original person that was hired for that was hired as a 12 Valley Fire and Rescue employee, but was reimbursed wholly by the county. So that was another major, I think, a concession on the county's part that in order to get the house in order, if you will, that the county would fund this position even if it was a TVFR employee. So the other big thing, well, there's a couple other big things actually about that agreement. One was day-to-day -day supervision of an emergency management function for the entire county, particularly for those four entities, was placed in the overall supervision of 12 about a fire and rescue. The county relinquished day-to-day -day control of that emergency management staff that they had and put them in the under the director, first and foremost, but the director then in turn answered on a day-to-day -day basis to a fire chief at 12 Fire and Rescue. 
more broadly, and this was the other kind of key factor, I think, for OSUM was the, the creation of an, an executive board, uh, an executive committee that would oversee, on a more broad level, oversee the operation of this consolidated uh, group of people. Um, so we had a board of directors that included in, uh, elected in some cases and appointed officials from each of the jurisdictions. We had Rob Drake, Mayor Drake at the time was was on my, was on the board. Um, we had uh, Charlie Cameron was on the board. Jeff Johnson from Tulsa Valley Fire was on the board, and uh, the fire chief from the city of Hillsborough. That was that was the board of directors in the beginning of OSIN. I was there. I was hired at that time to be the first. Uh, full-time emergency manager for Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue. And I want to tell you, that first year was <laughs> chaos. I mean, it, it was horrible. Um, um, people were really unhappy, particularly those people who had been brought out of their pre-existing environment and put into this new world. Uh, and mostly that was county people. Um, we lost, I think of eight people, we lost five in the first year, including the director. It was a very chaotic time. And, oh, by the way, you may remember a couple of things that happened in late 95 and early 96. The county was visited by probably the two most significant emergencies that we'd had in more than 10 years, 15 years. The windstorm in 1995, December of 95, and then the flood of 96. Those two big events came within weeks of, of the time that this new emergency management organization was stood up. So that added stress to an already stressful uh, situation with regard to OSUM and creating this new, this new consolidated environment. So by November, we, we started in November of 95. By November of 96, we lost the county emergency manager, we lost the newly hired Beaverton emergency manager, we lost the Hillsborough emergency manager, we lost the emergency manager from LUT, uh, the Washington County Department of Land and Transportation, and then we lost the director uh, because it consumed the director. So we, we had huge problems in that first year. Uh, and quite honestly, the, this normal experiment almost got thrown out the back door because the board was really frustrated and organizationally it was pretty dysfunctional. But then we started hiring new people. A whole bunch of change occurred. We started hiring people that didn't have the old paradigm, and we started moving forward. Um, and I, I became the director uh, after a year of living in the chaos there. I became the director in November of 96. Uh, and, and we hired new people. And we just started moving forward. And none of those people had any of the background, any of the problems, had any of the history that they had to overcome in order to work in this new uh, collaborative environment. And I, I think we did great work. Over the years, we did great work. We focused a lot um, on developing the county's program because that was certainly perceived by most to be the weakest link and the most important link. So we spent a lot of time developing the county's emergency operations center, getting it out of the basement of the jail, out of a room that only had 10 direct in-dial phones, uh, no computers back then, you know, and one cell phone. You know, that was, that was what we had when we started in the basement of the jail. We moved our emergency operations center over to, to the 911 center, utilized a bunch of their rooms, we invested less than $100,000 to upgrade their facilities to turn it into a functional emergency operations center. We built staffing for the EOC with county employees from all departments and then started training them and testing them. We threw them into the breach and uh, some of them didn't survive that because they couldn't handle the stress, particularly without having a lot of background yet. But uh, we, we really started making a lot of progress and we turned uh, we turned the corner and, and then OSIM became this really productive organization. Uh, along the way, uh, as activity picked up and our, I think our ability to deliver services picked up, uh, we made some more changes. In 2002, the Ganesh program had progressed to the point uh, where the, all of the partners in the organization, the four partners, agreed that they would share the costs of the director. So my position, instead of being completely funded by the county, became a shared uh, partnership between all four of the entities. So they all started paying 25% of the director's costs. Um, then in 2004, Tigard uh, joined with us and signed the Intergovernmental Agreement. 
So costs were then shared on a five-way basis, and that's the way we've operated since then. Uh, it is a collaborative process. What, what do we do? I've, I've talked to uh, a little bit of that already about the work that we do. Um, it's preparing, first and foremost, it's preparing our agencies. We do a lot to divide time to preparing businesses, preparing uh, our citizens as well. But fundamentally, our core mission is to get our agencies ready to respond to that higher level of emergency or disaster. So we plan, we write a lot of plans. Um, and we do some equipment, buying equipment, <coughs> pre-staging some equipment. We do a lot of training and we do a lot of exercising of our emergency response system. A lot of exercises and mentioned that earlier. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Another big part of what we do is partnerships. We cannot, we as emergency managers, and there's only a handful of us really in the county, and the county's got a staff with six full-time people now. Uh, one of them is fully fun uh, grant funded with Homeland Security money. Um, Beaverton's got three full-time staff. Hillsborough's got one. Tiger's got a three-quarter person devoted. Everybody else is collateral duty. But that's a handful of people. We can't do this planning without our partners. And our partners are rather uh, broad in terms of, of who all needs to be there to help us do the planning. Fire, law, public health, I mentioned them earlier. Public Works, huge partner that's involved in just about every response. We have to have our partners with us in order to write plans, in order to do training, in order to, to do exercises. So a lot of our work is building those relationships, building trust, um, and having a shared ownership of the system. And that's a tremendous part of my job, is to build those relationships and to build the trust uh, so that we can, uh, we can do this together. We do education, we do a lot of partnership in both here in the county and since 9-11 uh, and since that Homeland Security grant I mentioned earlier has come to town, we've done a heck of a lot of work at the regional level. A lot of regional planning, um, a lot of purchasing of equipment that is staged around the region to help us respond both locally and regionally. The work that we do is based on uh, a hazard analysis. Every county in the state, this is not a grant requirement, every county must do a hazard analysis and update it every five years. And uh, you must use a standard system that the state of Oregon uses. So we, we do that, and we've just recently updated our hazard analysis. Um, the hazard analysis takes into account history. How, how many times have these kinds of events happened in the past? What's the impact when they do occur? How much of the community is impacted by a particular hazard? What's the future look like? And the future may not look like the past because we continue to develop more and more land. And you have more infrastructure then that becomes at risk in the future to the same hazards. So we use, we use a future calculation in there as well. And then we also uh, look at threat and the maximum threat, worst case scenario. And we use a, a, just a formula to crank all that out. So what do you think our, what do you think the Washington County hazard analysis says are the hazards most likely to get us, get the most people, uh, uh, do the most damage, and then as we think about it in the future? Earthquake. Earthquake is up there, but it's not the top one. And why wouldn't it be the top one? Flooding. Flooding is high. Earthquake, why, why wouldn't an earthquake be the top one in our system, do you think? Frequency. It doesn't happen often enough to get a, a higher score in our methodology to get it up to the top. Unquestionably, it's the most significant threat in terms of catastrophic consequences. Uh, but it isn't the highest in our, in our scoring. Flood is high, but not as high as another one, as actually two others. Flooding, why isn't flooding so high? Because when it hits, how much of the community does it really directly impact? It's the, it's the lowlands, it's along the creeks and the rivers. So it doesn't get 100% of the community. What things that we have happen here pretty routinely impact 100% of the community? Wind, okay, wind storms. We haven't had a history of fire where the whole community, you know, we had the Tillamook burn in the 30s, but we really haven't had a catastrophic uh, fire. Um, snow and ice, okay, severe winter storm is our highest scoring threat. 
okay? And it's because it happens pretty frequently, it gets everybody about the same, you know, there's pockets of worst case in every scenario, but it, brought, it affects the whole community, it happens regularly, it causes us to activate our emergency system more regularly than anything else. Windstorm is second, earthquake is up there as well, flooding I think is third, earthquake is fourth, and there's a new, a new hazard that's been added to the top five, that hap not terrorism, it happened in 2009. What happened? In Everybody got a shot, right? H1N1, pandemic, okay? A pandemic now, because of H1N1, even though that wasn't in terms of actual consequences and death, um, pandemic has a history of being rather severe when they occur. Uh, it has happened routinely going back 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. So it has made it up into the top five now. So pandemic planning is, is, pandemic planning is, is one of our top hazards. So the work that we do, everything that we do, whether it's planning, procedures, training, exercise, should focus on, on those hazards that are most prevalent, most likely to hurt us, and most likely to hurt the most people. And I would say that is true in all that we do. There are other things that happen, um, landslides, you know, you name it. There's a whole spectrum of other types of events, power outages and others that we plan for, but many of them are embraced in those top five. So we try to devote almost all of our exercise activity uh, to those things. But I will tell you that once in a while we're made to do things that really aren't in the top five. And somebody mentioned it before, what have we devoted a lot of attention to over the last 10 years? Terrorism. Terrorism, okay? With the money that we all agreed to take in this region and across the state and across the country came requirements to do terrorism planning. So we, you know, we, it's not one of our top five hazards based on history, frequency, occurrence here, based on the likelihood that it would impact the whole community. But we have done a tremendous amount of planning around terrorism. All forms of terrorism, biological terrorism, chemical terrorism, IEDs, explosives, you name it. We've done a tremendous amount of planning around that. We have worked real hard in our region to not let it be just about that, but to try to make sure that everything we did would also serve some other purpose. Uh, whether it was a pandemic, a lot of bio bioterrorism planning really lends itself well to the pandemic planning. And a lot of catastrophic um, explosive things are similar to the consequences we might get from an earthquake blown up buildings, those kinds of things. So we have tried to benefit all hazards every time we've dipped our hand into the Homeland Security money. But there are outside factors like that that do drive us to focus attention a little bit away from those things that are uh, perhaps more a part of our core mission. So our areas of emphasis, let me show my time here, our areas of emphasis, I'm going to go back and hit on planning. What kind of planning do you do? We obviously have to have an emergency operations plan, and that's a pretty extensive document. It includes a basic plan, defines how we are going to operate in an emergency, and it has a lot of different annexes to it. Annexes around how we're going to communicate, how we're going to coordinate with each other, how we're going to do debris removal, how, we're going to, how law enforcement is going to uh, work together in a major emergency, how fire will respond in a major emergency, all of the different disciplines, public health annex, all of these different functional annexes. We also have some hazard specific uh, appendices that go into that plan around an earthquake that's different. I mean, what's different about an earthquake than a pandemic? There are serious differences. So we have some special things that are planned to talk to those differences. We spend a lot of time uh, working on plans our EOP in particular, our emergency operations plan. There's also two other plans that have become pretty core to what we're doing now. First is a natural hazard mitigation plan, and that really stemmed out of a grant requirement in the beginning, uh, has now become a mandate um, with a law that was passed uh, back in 2000 called the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. Uh, with that came requirements for having natural hazard mitigation plans. So we've done that. All the partners in our organization have developed their natural hazard mitigation plans. And another 
type of plan that really got, I would say, short shrift for many years, but is really kind of fundamental. You can't even do your emergency operations and response if you don't have one of these plans called the COOP plan. COOP is continuity of operations. In order for government to go help the public, the government must survive the incident itself. Okay, and planning for maintaining the continuity of government services is something that emergency managers have not focused on. It was a paragraph in, your, in our plan. Um, and now we're writing entirely uh, comprehensive coup plans for departments at the county level, for the cities are working on their coup plans. Can you think of a couple of incidents that drove the focus on coup planning across the country? Two big incidents in particular uh, really showed what could happen to government. Um, Katrina was one of the big ones. It was kind of a tipping point, I think, to finally get everybody on board. But 9-11 had a, 9 really started us down the path of really focusing on continuity of government operations, and then Katrina really cemented it when so many of the local governments were wiped out uh, and had done no planning about how to reconstitute government or reconstitute their services in order to save the public. Um, so we're doing a lot of work in coup planning right now. Um, counties very involved, uh, the cities, most of the larger cities are involved in coup planning. So that's taking a lot of our time. We also do procedures, though that's not generally what the emergency managers work on, but where I can help and try to focus is on countywide procedures. So a couple of things we're working on right now, one in partnership with public health and the water providers, is boil water procedures. Um, over the last couple of years, you've probably seen a couple of boil water events impacting Washington County. Is that accurate? Yeah. Portland's had two, one of which spilled, in, spilled into Washington County, um, affected West Slope Water District and affected the city of Tiger because they were getting water from the city of Portland along the particular system that uh, was contaminated. Um, then Portland had a second event, um, and then Tiger had an event of its own. And that was fairly recent. So after the first event, um, the Joint Water Commission started partnering with public and environmental health at the county, starting to work on some procedures uh, for coordinating a response to a boil water problem, a contaminated water contamination problem in Washington County. They worked on some procedures uh, together uh, without emergency management uh, to coordinate between joint water and health. They worked on those procedures. They tested them last spring in an exercise. And then we had the second Portland event, and then we had the Tiger event. Those two events kind of compounded the need to make that initial plan a little bit broader in its scope, and to talk more about, less, less about coordination, more about public information. How to coordinate the messaging to the public around a boil water event is a very, it's a very difficult problem because our water systems are so interconnected. Um, you may be getting your water from one jurisdiction or you live in one jurisdiction but you're getting your water from another jurisdiction, as was the case in the Tiger incident. Everybody north of 217 was getting their water from 12 Valley Water District. Everybody south of 217, almost everybody, was getting it from Tiger, City of Tiger's water. Okay, and it was only the Tiger system that was impacted. So coordinating your public messaging and getting the right message to the right people is really important. So since that, uh, since that event in the test they did back in April, uh, we brought the group back together. We brought a bunch of PIOs, public information officers, into the group, added emergency management into the group. Tiger Waters participating along. Uh, Beaverton Water attended the last meeting. And we're strengthening those procedures. Uh, and I think we'll be in better shape to coordinate our messaging as well as the uh, coordination between the entities themselves that are being impacted. So, we do work on things like that, and public health is doing that. We're supporting in that particular case. We worked on winch, what we call windshield surveys uh, of a post-earthquake uh, scenario. If we have an earthquake of any kind of significant magnitude, we need to have people get out and survey the community immediately to, deter to determine what the consequences are, where our biggest problems are, what critical infrastructure has been damaged, and ultimately, we need to have that information quickly so we can act in concert with each other, and we need to be able to prioritize where we're going to put our resources. So without that quick scan, that really fast assessment of where we stand after an earthquake, 
will make the wrong decisions. We may send resources out and help people, but we'll send them to the wrong places. We won't send them to where the highest need is or where the highest benefit can be achieved in the shortest time. So we've been working on windshield survey procedures. We finished them uh, earlier uh, last year, and then we tested them in a kind of a countywide exercise in, uh, in April of last year. Went really well. We got to go back and make a few tweaks to those procedures, but overall that process went really well, and the local governments have accepted, you know, bought into the process and what their individual roles and responsibilities are, and then the county taking responsibility for uh, gathering all of the data that's collected and then painting a countywide picture and then sharing that back with all of the local governments. So everybody has the same picture of what's what our starting situation is. Um, we're also working on a resource ordering procedure in terms of how we will ask each other for resources during an event and then also run that up to the state when, uh, because the state has not developed standard request procedures as well. We're working on our EOC always, uh, maintaining our emergency centers. We've done a lot of work on defining our multi-agency coordination process, how we need to coordinate with each other, what's, what's an emergency center, what's a department operations center, defining all of that, and then defining the roles and relationships between all of the activated organizations when we get into an emergency. We do some equipping, but not a lot. Um, mostly communications equipment, some supplies. We've, over the last few years, we purchased some shelter supplies to augment what the Red Cross can bring to the table, but we fully expect, and this is an area where we still have a gap, if we have a catastrophic earthquake, the Red Cross locally is going to be victims too. And many of the shelters that the Red Cross identified will not be functional, not be usable. Uh, so government has got to do more shelter planning where local governments, working with other nonprofits, churches in particular, need to be working better together to do community-based sheltering in the absence of the Red Cross until the cavalry could come in, the National Red Cross could mobilize their resources and bring in their forces from across the country to help the West Coast when we have that catastrophic earthquake. So we, we, do, some, we do some supplies, but not, not a lot. Staff training and exercising. Exercising is a big deal. That was, uh, even before we trained our people, we started exercising because we felt we were that far behind that we had to start putting people into the environment where they were going to be under stress and would have to perform, even in the absence of that point of training and plans. Uh, and so we just jumped right into it. And every year we've done one or two kind of large scale exercises across Washington County. And we open it up to all the partners to participate, whether it's county, city, hospitals, nonprofits, whoever it is that wants to partner in a particular exercise. We've, we've done that very aggressively. We've done multiple earthquake exercises, windstorm exercises, flooding exercises, a lot of terrorism exercises over the last 10 years. Uh, right now, we're in the throes of designing a big terrorism exercise again that will occur in uh, May uh, across the, the region. It'll be the first time we've done something regionally this big, regionally, more than two counties. Um, so it's going it, to it's gonna be pretty complicated. It's not as coordinated as I would like it to be, but it's a start. We've really never done a five-county major exercise before, so we're... We're making some progress here. I'm very involved in planning for that one. Uh, but we'll have uh, a bunch of law enforcement activity, fire, EMS activity, all the uh, hospitals are doing stuff, public health across all five counties is very involved. Uh, so it'll, it'll be a, a big to-do in the late part of May, 21, 22, and 23 May. So exercising is a big deal. And unfortunately, we've all turned into grant managers too. That's another part of our work portfolio these days, uh, which wasn't really a big part of our, our past. Um, the Homeland Security Grants have turned a lot of emergency managers into grant managers. All right, I want to move on and talk about change. Uh, come on, out of time? Okay, all right. So let me, let me just talk about change. We're about ready to uh, make some significant change in how we do emergency management in Washington County. Um, Talked about OSIM, this coordinated, uh, consolidated emergency management office. Over the years, we've become less consolidated. Several of the agencies have pulled their emergency managers, emergency managers back to their uh, offices, their home offices, and are working there. We're, we're not consolidated like we used to be. Uh, the county's program is not where it was in 1995. It's tremendously improved, very strong. 
Um, and we did a strategic planning process with the organization a couple of years ago. And stemming from all of these evolutionary things that have been happening in the program, the development of our program, and our strategic planning process, there's been agreement reached amongst the partners to um, move on to a new type of cooperative, cooperative arrangement. So we are working right now to rewrite the intergovernmental agreement that formed the Office of Consolidated Emergency Management. We will form a new cooperative organization where all the partners will continue to work together, will continue to share some expenses. Uh, but the significant components are uh, that the organization will no longer be consolidated. It will be a cooperative. The county staff will be moving to county campus. Um, the director will work at the direction of the assistant county administrator as opposed to working at TBFR's direction. The county is going to take on a bigger part of the cost of the organization, paying for 51% of the organizational cost. Um, mostly the director's cost and the other partners will share 49 percent of the cost. Uh, down the road uh, there will be a dedicated county EOC that will be always up and always ready to go. That's coming. It will be in the Walnut Street Center um, in the old archives area and uh, upstairs. So that will be the new dedicated EOC and that will be home to the emergency management staff uh, probably by the end of the next fiscal year. So the intergovernmental agreement is going to be written. We're going to enter into a new type of co uh, uh, cooperation, collaborative arrangement. Um, and I look forward to being involved in that transition and helping guide that transition with the uh, existing uh, partners that uh, are committed to making these changes. And there are also going to be opportunities for other local governments to join into the partnership as well. Uh, don't know what that looks like yet. We're still writing that into the intergovernmental agreement. But any, any city, special district, that wants to become a partner will be offered that opportunity. I think there will be opportunities to participate with or without contributing funding to that partnership. Um, so, anyway, big changes, uh, big changes coming in our program um, at the collaborative, cooperative level, and then the county itself is making some significant changes in terms of the county government. The, Folks that have worked for the sheriff are no longer going to be working within the sheriff's office. They're being pulled out, and they all work for the county administrator's office. So big, big changes there as well as the dedicated emergency operations center. So that's really what I want to talk about. Open it up for Q&A. We had a video. I don't think we'll spend time with the video. We're running short on time, uh, if that's okay. And I know you wanted to show that it's the zombie apocalypse video. No. Uh, so, yeah, it, it is on the, I know it's on LUT's website. Uh, if you go to the WC Roads website, uh, you can find the link to the zombie the zombie video there. Uh, it, it really is a focus on the county EOC. It talks about the role of the county EOC, interviews several of the county staff that work in the Emergency Operations Center, what their roles and responsibilities are, uh, and it has a one of the sheriff's uh, volunteers, um, one of their search and rescue cadets that is dressed up as a zombie and making stops around the EOC. But it's very cute, very nice, uh, and very educational, too. So, John? Okay, questions are open to forum members only. Um, one question, succinct and to the point. Um, and I'll call Bill Kroger first. Hi, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thanks for coming in today. It's comforting to know that so much is going on. I'm a, a member of the volunteer with the Beaverton Community Emergency Response Teams. And uh, I went through some absolutely fabulous training. Uh, part of it's designed to, uh, to help people to get their neighborhoods organized if something happens. And uh, my, subsequent to the training, my wife who went through it and I have organized our own neighborhood and stuff. I was just wondering if at the county level, if there's specific training like that and what happens to the people in the unincorporated area. Yeah, the, the county does not have its own program. There are several jurisdictions that, that offer CERT. Beaverton is one of those. Hillsboro uh, offers the training as well. And Hillsboro also takes their training out to West County. And they bring in folks from the unincorporated area. Beaverton does the same with its program. Offers it to people in the unincorporated area, particularly within the Beaverton School District boundaries. Uh, Tigard has a program. Sherwood had a program. Doesn't exist anymore. They lost their emergency manager. So at this point, there is no countywide program. 
And I think the primary reason for that is that in order for the CERT to be effective for CERT teams, community emergency response team, for it to be effective, they really need to have connections back to a an agency that they will serve in times of emergency. You've got to have a department, a division, a city, special district who is going to coordinate your response and organize you and then maintain the work that you do. Um, so we haven't found that home at the county level yet. We found it more with the first responder agencies uh, out in the community. So uh, Beaverton, uh, Hillsborough was the first to do it. Beaverton jumped on board. Tigert's doing it aggressively. Sherwood had it, went away. King City's done it a little bit, and Hillsborough's expanded their program out in West County, and we're offering it to the unincorporated folks that are served by those, those particular jurisdictions. Hope that helps. So. Hi, I'm Marilyn Williams, and I'm a forum member. Uh, my question is, I, I thought I understood at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about military involvement in this too, or did I misunderstand that? Uh, the State Emergency Management Program is based in the military department. It's, oh. a, it's a division within state military. Uh, it just operates from there, but it has no other direct involvement. Uh, although I will tell you that the state military, the National Guard, uh, is a huge asset that comes and helps all of us in times of emergency. And there really is a, a, a very logical connection between uh, emergency management at the state level and the Guard, because the Guard is one of those first, first responder resources that we tap into. Flood response, heavy equipment, uh, communications, water purification, you name it. The, the Guard has got those resources if they're not deployed. Um, so it is a logical connection. Uh, and it, honestly, it is a much better connection than when they were in state police, uh, where they got no support and really no other direct access to resources that they get from the state military. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leeper. Hello, Scott. Hey, John. Good program. Thank you, sir. One thing I have heard during the course of your presentation is the staffing that you need for 24-7 coverage. And I would just like for you to address what the different county departments as well as different cities have got to pre-designate personnel to step in and be of assistance in the event of an emergency. Yeah, it's a large group of people, and, and we do pull on, all, at the county level, we pull on every department to provide staff into the emergency center. You know, we have first responder people, we have emergency managers, but when push comes to shove, when we have a large-scale emergency, it's, it's pretty much all hands on deck. Everybody needs to be able to be a responder into the EOC to do coop operations, whatever it is. So the county you see our staffing, if you, if you looked at a full shift of people, we're talking 50, 60, 70 people, that just one shift. And if we run 12 on, 12 off, where we've got two shifts of people, now you're talking you know, 120, 140 people, depending on how big the incident is. So it, it, can, it can drain a lot of your resource. And so at the county level, and this is true for the cities as well, uh, you draw from all your departments. We have library staff, we have community corrections, we have juvenile services at, at, at the county that have staff that work in the ELC. Uh, LUT has its own operations center called the De uh, Department Operations Center, and in that facility, just for LUT, they have as many people as we have in the EOC. Um, so you take LUT's commitment to both their department and to the EOC, you're talking big time uh, responsibilities for that agency. You look at the cities, same thing. 20, 30 people on one shift. 40 people, depends on the size of the organization. That's been, a, that's been a huge issue, trying to sustain that when you don't have emergencies to remind everybody why they're doing this. And when their primary responsibility is the library or juvenile justice or community corrections, whatever it is, community development, whatever your other function is day to day, it's hard to get people to commit into the training and exercising and then sustain their, their skills. Um, some, of the, some of the cities uh, have really looked again at what they were doing and they've drawn in a little bit in terms of the number of staff they're trying to commit and sustain in their, in their skills for that. Uh, Beaverton is doing that right now. Hillsboro is doing that right now. Tiger hasn't gone down that path, but I think every city is struggling with 
uh, how many people they can commit to this to maintain the skill set uh, and still be ready to rock and roll, you know, when, when the big one happens. Thank you, John. John Hutzler, hey, John. former member. Um, you certainly gave the impression uh, during the first part of your presentation that the consolidated emergency management uh, had was working well. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could address uh, what the reasons or the motivations for the changes that you mentioned at the end are. Where, where is the uh, motivation for that coming from? Well, I'd say it's coming from several different places. One, uh, from the emergency managers themselves who feel that they need to be with the staff that they support every day. Uh, and that goes way back where, where we started consolidated progressively. Hillsborough took their emergency manager back to the put them over in Hillsborough Fire Station. Tiger, when Tiger came in, they had a half-time emergency manager never consolidated with the rest of the group. TVFR, when they opened up their new command center in Tiger, took their emergency manager with them over there. So that whole notion of consolidation has progressively moved away. And the, and the managers have longed, the county managers in particular, who have been at TVFR's building for years, have longed to be over with the staff that they're working with and training with and exercising all the time and doing planning with all the time. Um, so that's one factor. Another factor is, honestly, that the county's program started weak, and it isn't weak anymore. The county has a very strong program, and one of the fundamental reasons that we created OSIN was to fix the county program. Not just the county-wide program, but fix the county program. Make it be what it needed to be to support Beaverton and TVFR and Hillsborough and the other partners. So that underlying thing is not, not there anymore. So, and then we did this strategic planning process, and there was a lot of discovery in that process about where we are and what we're doing and what makes sense as we go forward and how we do it. Uh, and I will tell you also that my entire board of directors changed <laughs> over two years. Mayor Drake was gone, Jeff Johnson was gone, Charlie Cameron was gone, Fire Chief England was gone, City Manager Tiger was gone. All of those board members left within two years and a whole new crop of young, younger uh, leaders with different ideas have come to the table and say, boy, this just doesn't make sense to us today. Uh, it makes more sense to do it another way. And so uh, I, I think those, all of those factors have come together at a rather unique time, much as the OSIN thing came together at a time when there was a different set of circumstances. How are you? I'm fine. Good Kathy Stanton, the forum member, thank you so much for coming today. And for those who do not know every acronym like some of us do, LUT, Land Use Transportation Department at the county. Yeah. Um, my question um, is more of a comment and then to find out what the county is doing or will be doing. I was fortunate while being on the city council in Beaverton to attend and participate in some tabletop exercises at the city and to be part of a at the library um, in a emergency situation and you know, how do you guard the doors and uh, deal with lights off. Um, does the county plan to do any of those kind of things in your new configuration to take a particular um, chemical spill or whatever it might be on the road to the local jurisdictions for the staff of each individual jurisdiction that's a participant, or do they do their own and there's no coordination? Well, mostly do their own, but I would say there is coordination. Um, the, we haven't gone and done that level of delivery of exercise activity. We've done the kind of the countywide tabletop exercises where everybody comes together and talks through a scenario. Uh, we've done large-scale functional where we staff our emergency operations centers and then coordinate with each other. And we've done full-scale exercises where we have police and fire and even that, and public works out responding in the field, coordinating with their emergency centers, those kinds of things. We haven't done more of the, what I would say, day-to-day -day crisis level response, like an intruder in the building, a coordinated delivery of that. Uh, that, that really falls more to the first responder agencies, the active shooter type training is being done, if that's the kind of scenario that you're, you're talking to. Um, uh, police and fire are doing a lot of that right now, Hillsborough in particular. I was thinking of an airborne chemical spill 
or something that is going to go crossing jurisdictional lines and, and impact multiple thousands. Yeah, we, we have done those kinds of actions. Thinking they were over. I've got to sign off. Okay. Yeah. Let me jump on. Okay. Sorry, basically we're, the, the constraints of the television, we work within a 58 and a half minute for, uh, format. More questions will happen, we can run the zombie video in just a second. Washington County Public Affairs Forum, again, is a volunteer organization bringing interesting speakers and community to the community. And again, you can be a member by contacting our secretary, Pat Mayberry, or responding online. And I think we're done. I'm John Tyner, President Forum. Thank you for coming. Let's run the video or do the questions, whatever we want to do. I want to thank you for stopping. Any other questions that you want to do now that we're off the air? question is on uh, communications. Um, the dream of, uh, it came out of the uh, terrorist event was that all, everybody would communicate on the same communication system. That hasn't happened. Not exactly. And so, you have different departments and We're, different jurisdictions or different communication systems. How yeah. close or how far away are we from everybody talking the same network? Uh, we're, we're much closer, but I think it's a, a dream that we'll ever be there where everybody has the same tools on the same frequencies. Um, but regionally, uh, there's been a tremendous investment in the communications infrastructure in the 800 megahertz system that we have, Clackamas County has, uh, Portland uses an 800 megahertz, Clark County uses an 800 megahertz system. All of us now, on all four of those systems, have much expanded capacity, bigger, more, uh, better equipped radios that, and channels that are programmed on all of those radios that would enable a responder in Washington County to go to Clark County and talk to responders in Clark County. Fire, law, EMS. Um, not so with public works. We're not there with public works. Uh, some of the public works, most of the public works agencies still use a different radio system. They use VHF. And uh, we're working towards getting trunked VHF systems where at least the public works agencies could all talk with each other. Uh, LUT, Washington County Land Use and Transportation, has recently shifted over to the 800 megahertz public safety radios. So they will now have the opportunity and ability to talk to fire and law on scene. So progressively we're getting there. I don't know that we'll ever have true interoperability. What we would like to see happen is to have a regional radio system where everybody's on the same system. Uh, right now we have four of the same kinds of system, but they're all operated separately. Uh, and they have different frequencies, different operating procedures. A regional dream is a regional radio system but, and there is a regional radio group that's been formed to try to address that issue. But I gotta tell you, the, the bill for that is extraordinary to do that. $386 million for the region and that a forklift upgrade ain't gonna happen, I don't think. Uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you follow it at the state level, the Oregon Wireless Interoperability Network, something called OWIN, uh, the state has been trying to do the same kind of thing with a, a, a statewide VHF system and their numbers were something on that magnitude as well to bring the state system up to that kind of statewide interoperability just on the VHF system and they just ran into a brick wall with money and so I don't, I don't think we're ever going to have that ultimate level of interoperability that is dreamed about. But I will tell you that interoperability today is far superior to what it was prior to 9-11. And it will continue to get better. Never be perfect. So, Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm thank you for being here. John McWilliams, a uh, former member. And so I have a question uh, relating to a uh, facility here in, in, uh, in the county, and that's Hag Lake. Yes. Uh, wonderful recreation, fishing. Water um, supply. Plus, uh, people drink the water, so yes. uh, so and it's really important for that. Um, unfortunately, if we get this nine-point earthquake that comes through, um, since it's all on just uh, dirt on dirt, mm -hmm. uh, most likely it's going to go. Yes. Uh, what do we have set up for all the people that live in Forest Grove or at least in the area, but in Gaston? And other good, good, good question. That's a 
complicated situation. As many of you know, if you're following what's been happening in Hack Lake, the dam uh, was built not to not to address a 9.04 minute long Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. It was really built more towards a seven to eight magnitude earthquake. And it was before they really figured out a lot about geologically about the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, there were, prior to these discoveries, there were efforts in our county underway to have a bunch of local governments purchase the dam and start owning and operating the dam as a, as a water supply. Uh, there was also efforts to raise the dam. There was a project to raise the dam to build our water supply for the future. Well, the findings of the, of the seismic study that was done as a consequence of all the new research on Cascadia uh, led the partners to back away from any hope of buying the dam and are really seriously backing away now from um, the likelihood of raising the dam. It may still be an option in the future, but, but it's way off the table right now. And Twelve Valley Water, the Joint Water Commission, they're looking to the Willamette now for their water. Uh, so the seismic risk is real for the dam. Uh, likely it will fail. Uh, so then we've got to hope it's the right time of the year uh, when we have that earthquake. Um, if the dam is full, uh, when that failure occurs, if it occurs, um, it will create the magnitude of a 500-year flood, uh, by FEMA terms, a 500-year flood, which would impact the southern part of Forest Grove. It would certainly take out the mill, take out anything in the Scoggins Valley below the dam, take out Highway 47, do a fair amount of damage in those rural areas um, in Laurelwood, Dilly, that area, would get the south part of Cornelius, uh, then would continue downstream and would do um, more harm down in Tualatin and some of the other uh, Shoals area, Groner. Um, so what's being done? Well, uh, we can't fix the dam, okay? Long short term, we can't fix the dam. The Bureau's got a study, the Bureau knows they got a problem. The Bureau, when I say the Bureau, the Bureau of Reclamation owns that dam. Uh, it's operated by Tualatin Valley Irrigation District, but it's owned by the Bureau of Reclamation. So they have a study that they just finished that they haven't publicly released yet, but it, the drafts are out. Uh, they know they have a problem. They're going to eat. They're going to have to fix the problem themselves. Fix the dam. Until that's fixed, the threat is real. Uh, there is. There are plans in place for the dam um, for an emergency. The bureau has plans that they routinely exercise for escalating an event uh, up to a catastrophic level to where they have to do an emergency drawdown of the dam, which will do damage of itself. Um, if it catastrophically fails, there's nothing that can be done other than to evacuate. The downstream communities. If that happens at a 9.0 magnitude earthquake, there's no hope that first responders are going to get out and evacuate those folks because first responders aren't going to be able to get around. They'll be having a hard time getting into their equipment. Um, so the, the citizens are really going to have to do a lot more planning for themselves around that catastrophic earthquake, knowing that they're in a zone that could be inundated um, and knowing at the time of an incident what the consequences are, you know, the likelihood is that it's going to happen and that they're going to have to do something about it. But we do have plans, we've written plans, we've exercised plans, um, both with the Bureau and at the county level. We've done tabletops, we've done some full-scale exercises around a catastrophic failure. Um, but in the end, I think it's going to lie a lot on the citizens knowing what they need to do to get to higher ground just on the belief that the dam is going to fail. If it happens in the summer, you know, late fall when the dam is, uh, the reservoir level is way down, it's not a big deal. But if it happens in the middle of summer, early summer, as they start to fill the dam, if you're familiar with how they operate the facility out there, starting February 1st, they start to fill, and they shoot, to, I think it's May 1st, they shoot to have a full pool. Um, so anytime after May 1st, and you know, a little time before May 1st, and then going through the summer, that's if the earthquake happens then, you really need to know that you're in inundation zone and you need to head to high ground. It's like a tsunami. It's kind of like knowing that a tsunami is coming uh, after an earthquake and you need to head to high ground if you're in that, if you're in that area. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. so Ann? I was going to clap. <laughs> oh, do you want to watch it? Thank you. Do you want to watch the movie?